I also am very, very pleased now to introduce you to Dr. Anna Jurisic. Dr. Jurisic is a low vision optometrist who provides low vision rehabilitation and uh, services to visually impaired people at the Clearview Vision Institute. She's a well-known uh, educator and a very dynamic speaker uh, who works to promote and improve low vision services. She um, is also what even I find even more dazzling, a mom to four little kids. How old is the oldest one, Anna? The oldest one is six. <laughs> so uh, my mind spins at having that many children that young. But uh, And she just became an athlete in 2012 and 2013. She completed our Cycle for Sight, 140-kilometer uh, fundraising and bicycle event uh, in support of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and she did it on a tandem cycle with a uh, visually impaired partner. So here to speak to you about getting the most out of your remaining eyesight is Anna Jurisic. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you for, for, uh, to the Foundation Fighting Blindness for having me here today. What I want to do first is ask, how many of you have ever been told, yes, you have macular degeneration and nothing more can be done for you? So with just a show of hands, thank you. As uh, um, Dr. Schwartz had mentioned earlier, this was something that was very commonly told to patients back when I first uh, started practicing, which was 17 years ago. There weren't very many treatment options. There was only really the laser treatment that was done if there was a bleeding of the blood vessels, but there were not uh, no other kind of medical treatments that were really available. So many patients used to be told, nothing more could be done for you. And the reason that you see me standing here in front of you is that one thing that often was neglected, and st still sometimes today as well, is a lot of people who have vision loss are just not told of all the different vision aids that are available. So you can live with your vision loss and maybe be able to gain some of that independence back. But unfortunately, they're not a cure. Now, when we talk about a low vision exam, this is something that usually takes about an hour and a half. So any of my colleagues who also practice low vision, our whole goal is to see how we can help maximize your remaining vision. Like I said, there's no cures, but we're going to do our best to see how we can maximize your remaining vision. And what's really important to determine right at the beginning of the assessment is what is the vision goal of that person that's sitting in my chair when they come in. Because I can have a patient who told, tells me that they used to be an avid reader, and they have not been able to read for years now. And the next patient that I see after them will say, no, I never like to read. So how I'm going to be doing my uh, assessment is going to be different between the two people. Now that person who says, well, you know, I never like to read, still I'm going to be trying to see if I can show them different aids that can maybe help them see their dinner plate a little bit better. Or even though they're not an avid reader, they may still want to be able to see that flyer that comes in the mail to see what's on sale. So maybe being able to see how much are the bananas uh, uh, this week at Loblaws or Sobeys. So even if you're not an avid reader, near tasks still may be something important that I still have to be addressing. Now, how many of you have ever had a low vision assessment, either with an eye doctor or at the CNIB, with a show of hands? Yeah, great, thank you. Like I said, with the assessment, vision goals is the, the most important thing that we always have to start off with. What is the vision goal of that patient? And then afterwards, what I always do is see, what can I do with regular eyeglasses? Because that patient, when they come and sit in my chair, I know in their mind, they want to know, what can you do for me with glasses? So I actually spend quite a bit of time to see, how can I improve their vision with regular glasses? Because sometimes they might have gone to the eye doctor for years, and because they have the macular degeneration, the doctor said, well, there's no need to change your glasses. And not a lot of extra effort isn't put into seeing if maybe there is something that could be done to improve it. After I've done the regular part, which my colleagues and the optometrists uh, and we'll do in terms of determining the prescription, I then start to introduce what's called a prism. And I show the patient a prism to see if that's going to help 
maximize our vision. What the prism will do is it's going to redirect the way the light focuses at the back of the eye. So instead of hitting them right smack in that macula, as Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Bakshi had mentioned that has um, the most amount of damage with the macular degeneration, I'm going to shift it maybe above the macula, to the right of it, to the left of it, or down below into an area that's a little healthier to see if that may help that patient get that little extra bit of optimal vision. And I do this with each eye separately. And sometimes what will happen is I find that 50% of the time, the patient's going to appreciate the prism with one eye. But then now I have to check to see, are they going to appreciate it with both eyes? Because sometimes they can appreciate it with one eye only, but when I have them look with both eyes, it doesn't make a difference. So it's not something I am going to be prescribing. But I do document it in my notes. After I've done that part, then I actually see, well, what can I do with the up close and the reading? Because a lot of people don't want to be relying on a magnifier. Well, ways that we can actually give you more magnification is by giving you a higher reading power in your eyeglasses. Now, the only bad thing is this, the higher we put that power in the reading glasses, the closer you have to hold that page. And then I have to be counseling that patient. Yes, I can get you to read maybe the newspaper print, especially if we add the good lighting, a good task light that's focused right down on that page. But you're going to have to hold it this closely. You can't hold it here. It's not going to be clear. And the way I show the patient of the proper place to hold the reading material is instead of giving the paper or the reading card here and bring it closer, I tell them, I want you to move that reading card right to your nose. It's all blurry. Now I want you to move it away until it clears up. Because this way they can find that right focal point. If we do it the other way, I just see that. I say, move it closer. They just move it about an inch closer. Well, okay, let's bring it a little bit closer, another inch closer. And they're so resistant to having to move it right here. But if we do it the other way, they usually find that focal point. Now, the next part that's really important with a low vision assessment is to address the area of glare. About 60% of my patients, I find, they have issues, not just with outside sunlight and glare outside, but it's actually the overhead lights indoors, especially if they go into a grocery store that's quite bright. Um, they have the really bright illumination, and it's very glaring. So there's different types of filters that one type is called the Corning filter, and they're usually either yellow or orange in color. And it's very simple when I show the different Corning lenses or the glare cutting lenses. I basically put it in front of their eyes, and I ask them, does this make things more comfortable? Does it seem more soothing? And I remove it. For somebody who actually is going to benefit from the glare cutting lens, it's immediate of a response. They say, wow or I see the expression on their face. The person who's just kind of like looking and looking and trying to search to see if it's helping, I know it doesn't help. So it's something very quick and simple. And if the glare cutting lens makes a difference, it's something that we can prescribe in their glasses. And the actual corning lenses are actually photochromatic. So that means that when they're indoors, it's this color. This is just one version. There's another one that's a yellow version. When they go outside, it can deepen in color. And for a long time, these corning lenses were only available in glass that were photochromatic. Now there's actually a US company that I can actually get the photochromatic lens made in either the polycarbonate, which is an impact resistant lens material, or plastic. And I'm a big fan of the polycarbonate because if you already have poor vision, especially if you only have one good seeing eye, I will always be prescribing either a polycarbonate or a different uh, Trivex lens material that's impact resistant. Because Murphy's Law says when you only have one good eye, if something's were ever going to happen and a ball comes flying at you and it's going to shatter the glasses, the damage is going to happen to your good eye. So we always have to make sure it's impact resistant. So after I've done that, and I've also discussed if maybe sunlight is an issue and we discuss different options in terms of sunglasses, I start really getting into the crux of what a low vision assessment is going to do that's totally different to, to what that patient has ever seen. And that's actually introducing a lot of the different vision aids. And I always, most often, I start off with the near viewing because most of my patients, I say a good 85 to 90% of my patients say, they want to read again. And so I start off where I always show them, depending on where their vision is, 
uh, traditional magnifiers, where it could be a simple dome magnifier, which is a low-powered magnifier. So that's good for somebody who's just at the early stages of having vision loss. And uh, some people always ask, well, when should somebody be referred for a low vision assessment, or when should they come in? When their vision starts affecting them where they can't read that paper anymore, or they're no longer able to drive, that person is now definitely a perfect candidate to see what aids are available. So I start off with the dome magnifier if their vision is still not too bad, but they need that little extra help. It looks more like a paperweight. I have a sample of one up in the uh, exhibit area. But then I go to a handheld magnifier. Most people have always seen a handheld magnifier. And a big thing with the handheld magnifiers is the ones that you buy in a store uh, if you go to, um, it could be a Shoppers or a Staples, or some people even pick them up at dollar stores, they're very low powered. And most people with macular degeneration or any other eye condition need much stronger magnification or magnifying devices than the two, or if you're lucky, three time magnification that you find in, in the regular stores. A lot of my patients are using their five times or six times. And when you're given a handheld magnifier, it's really important that when you're holding the magnifier that you first put it against the page, then lift it up away until you get to that right focal point. But the handheld magnifier is really designed for quick spotting. It's not your ideal device if you're going to be wanting to read the newspaper for long periods, especially if you have arthritis and you have those shaky hands. With a handheld magnifier, it's very difficult to keep it in focus. So a handheld magnifier might be a good option to see the mail as it comes in, or have it in your purse when you go uh, to the store and you want to see a price tag. If you're going to be wanting to read a newspaper, for, or a book for longer periods, I then show them an illuminated stand magnifier, which is already preset that you place it against the page, and it's a correct distance, the lens is a correct distance away from the page to give you the right magnification, and you just stream it along. And again, it's something I have a sample just in the exhibit area that if you want to see afterwards. So that's ideal for longer periods. Now to get more of a view, if you bring it closer, you'll get more of a view, but still, the field of vision in terms of these magnifiers is quite limited. The part that I get excited about is what's happened with technology. Now, how many of you in the room may have one of those large screen CCTV machines? With a show of hands, thank you. Those I always refer to as your Lexus or Cadillac of reading machines. Some of these can go up to 85 times. Back when I first was practicing, um, you could get assistance and you still can from the government program for these big large reading machines, but they only covered the black and white versions. Luckily a few years ago, uh, they actually start covering the color version through the government program. And it's amazing. These devices, the newer ones, can go even up to 85 times the magnification. But the only thing is they weigh about 45 pounds. And they take good real estate in that uh, in your home. So if you don't have a lot of space, it may not be convenient for that patient. But because of this technology, spin-offs have come about. And the part that I get really excited about is that there's these new handheld digital reading devices. And I have one just in my hands right now that I'm just going to take a quick image here. So these are digital reading magnifiers where I just took a quick caption of, the, of my paper that's in front of me. And you can make this more magnified. Some of the newer ones can go up to 24 times the magnification. Some of the newer ones, if you don't need a lot of magnification, start out at one and a half times, which is really key, because those that start out at one and a half times magnification, in the field of vision, you could put a whole newspaper column. So instead of having to go across as you're reading, you could just slide it down. But there's even a new one that's actually, I'm just waiting to get it in my hands. I saw it a few weeks ago, and my uh, unit comes actually as of uh, in two weeks. It's called the Prodigy, and this is an interesting one because it could actually take a scan of what you have reading, what you want to read, and it could actually stream it for you. So you don't have to be holding now that paper and this on top. It will stream it for you so you could just read it, or it can actually read it back to you. And the other part is this can also be attached to a special CCTV unit, so it acts as a camera for that CCTV unit. And it's kind of like the, the tablet technology, like what these smartphones are doing, and where it's actually touch screens. It's really impressive what technology is doing. But these are the devices that help allow 95% of my patients 
to read again. And a lot of my patients, if you would have seen, I was showing where the screen is white on black. Seven out of 10 of my patients prefer reading letters white on black. I can't achieve that with traditional glasses or traditional magnifiers. And the reason they like it, it's less glaring. The next part that I do is I start showing different aids in terms of distance viewing. And typically for my macular degeneration patients, they want to be able to watch TV, see faces again. And for a long time, there were just these high-powered headborne binoculars. And they're still actually wonderful devices, but the field of vision was quite limited. You would have to change the focus. Um, I'm a, a big fan of the headborne ones, because if you're going to be watching TV, you're not going to be holding a handheld magnifier and watching a TV program with, with those types of magnifiers. You want to have something that's headborne. But one of my favorite ones is one that I've introduced about three years ago to the practice. It's actually a pair of telescopic glasses that look like almost a pair of glasses. They magnify 2.2 times. There's nothing for you to change the focus. And the amazing thing is when you have these on, you can see the TV, you can see faces, and the quality of the optics is quite impressive. Now, how I was mentioning in terms of reading devices and CCTVs, another part that's quite exciting is what they're trying to do with electronic digital technology as well. There are a few other, there are a few products that were out over the last decade. Uh, two of the main ones were discontinued, but as of about, um, uh, it was back in, I think it was September of 2010, I got to see a prototype of a new device it was, that is actually uh, now available to the public called eSight Eyewear, and I know they have a booth set up here. It's a company from outside of Ottawa that's created this electronic video binocular system, which you can use to look at things in the distance. You can also use it to look at the intermediate. You can also use it to look reading up close where you're holding it arm's length away. And you can change the modes of it in terms of that white on black, if that's what you prefer when it comes to reading. And you can magnify according to the, your needs. It doesn't work for everybody, but for some of the patients, it really has made a world of difference of what it could provide them. And so if, if you haven't heard about that, uh, the east side eyewear, please check it out. It's something quite interesting to see, because this is where technology is going. And when we talk about technology, um, actually later this week, I'm actually speaking at a low vision conference in Minneapolis. And I'm talking about all the new technology in terms of tablets and smartphones and all these apps that are available and the e-readers that are available. This has really opened up a new door for people living with vision loss or who are completely blind. And it's an exciting area. I have patients in their 90s who are using the e-readers and they have the tablets. So something that you definitely want to be trying to embrace the new technology because it's going to offer you a lot of extra options in different ways that you can actually see again to read. When I'm finished up with a low vision assessment, I always have a look inside your eyes right at the end. Because I want to see where has the damage occurred. I don't do that at the beginning of my assessment because you know how the, we like to use those bright lights shining in your eyes? As soon as I use those bright lights, I'll bleach out everything. So everything that I was talking about earlier, you would not have been able to, to see with the devices. So I always have a peek afterwards. Then I summarize what are the best aids for that person. And I have to make sure I can tie it back to those vision goals. Now, a lot of patients always come in and ask, is there any way you can get me to drive again? There's a few patients have been able to help uh, obtain that. Unfortunately, a lot of patients, they're not able to see the vision with regular glasses to drive. I can get it with these kind of bioptics often. And in 40 of the US states, if you go through a, a, a special program, you can actually possibly drive with these in the US. You're just not, a bit, and they're not it's not possible to drive with any of these bioptic type devices here in Canada. But the other thing that I just want to mention in conclusion is when you have vision loss, it's really important to open up your support network. And for some people, I find it's very difficult for them to be able to relate to family members of how they're seeing, because their family sees them. And they look on the outside, and they look how they always did. Maybe they've gotten a few years older. There might be a few more wrinkles. We're all getting more wrinkles as we all get older. Um, and they can't, the family members don't always understand how that patient or that family member sees things. Because remember, with macular degeneration, it only affects your central vision. And like Dr. Schwartz said, you cannot go completely blind from macular degeneration alone. And sometimes, 
that person with macular degeneration might be able to see that there's actually a bug crawling on the floor. Because they're in the peripheral vision, they see the movement. As soon as they look directly at it, it disappears. But their family member who might have just heard them say, is that a bug? And they're like, but you're not supposed to be able to see. It gets to be confusing. So if you can get a good support network with other people who might be living with vision loss, who might have macular degeneration, it's something I highly recommend. Um, there's a lot of great organizations here in the city, and some of them are actually in, uh, in the exhibit area. Trailblazers Tandem Bike Club, how Sharon mentioned, I did the, uh, the Cycle for Sight event um, last year and this year, and it's my way of giving back to my low vision patients. It's an amazing event supporting an amazing cause, the Foundation of Finding Blindness. It's something very dear to me. And I actually do it with the tandem, uh, the Trailblazers Tandem Bike Club. I actually borrow their tandem bike, and I got to do it with someone who is completely blind, my partner Delano. And the tra Trailblazers is a great organization, so if anybody likes to cycle or used to like to cycle, they have captains who are willing to go out and go on rides. They just got their newest shed located at the ferry docks. I was able to go a few weeks ago with my partner, and we went on Center Island on a bike ride, which I think is just amazing that they have about five different sheds throughout the city. There's also um, uh, a ski club for the visually impaired. There's hockey for the visually impaired. There's curling, there's golf. There's a Elmville um, theater group for those who are blind. So there's a lot of great organizations that are available um, here in Toronto and other uh, large communities as well might have different organizations. But what I do recommend is be a self-advocate. Look at all the different options. If you are living with vision loss, there may be different aids that can help you see again. There could be that extra support through having a support group, because as Dr. Schwartzen mentioned, what often isn't talked about but happens is that people living with vision loss have a high incidence of having clinical depression at least at one point in their journey of their vision loss. And usually clinical depression is, is defined as if you stop doing the things that you like to do for two weeks or longer, the big thing is getting you out of that state of clinical depression. So be a self-advocate. Look at all the options. See if there are different things, if medically or, uh, or surgically there are no options, or if you're going with the ongoing treatments that are available, which have really made a big impact for those living with the macular degeneration. Look, see, learn. There's a lot out there. Foundation Finding Blindness is a great resource. CNIB is a great resource as well. So thank you. I know that perfect vision is 2020, but if you're given a reading of 20 to 300, how much percentage of vision have you lost? When uh, so the question is, perfect vision. Many of us think it's 2020, and if you have a vision of 20 to 2300, how much percentage of vision is it? So first, I want to make a note that there's actually a lot of people who can actually, there are people who can see better than 2020. 2020 was just a standard that was just created, but there are people who can see better than 2020. With the use of different vision aids, I can get people to sometimes see even better than 2020, even if their vision might be 2300. I don't like to use percentage when it comes to defining vision, but what I will let you know, when you have 2300 vision, you're your best way of understanding how you see something is that if somebody has 20-20 vision, with which kind of we have uh, termed as being perfect vision, um, if you have 20-20 vision and somebody has 2300 vision, the person with 2300 vision, when they're standing 20 feet away from an object, that person with 20-20 vision can stand 300 feet away from the same thing, and they see the exact same. So that kind of gives you a perspective of what these numbers mean. Because when we talk about percentage, remember macular degeneration, 2300 with macular degeneration affects only your central vision, but you have your peripheral. 2300 vision for somebody who has retinitis pigmentosa or advanced glaucoma, they may only have a five degree field of vision, and in that five degree field of vision only see 2300 it gets a little bit complicating to give that percentage as an answer. Thank you for the question. In order to see someone like yourself, a low um, vision optometrist, do you need a referral from a doctor or an another? 
I prefer receiving a, a referral if possible because then I can actually get a baseline from their existing ophthalmologist or optometrist of what the vision is like. For somebody who has a known vision loss and you know they might have been termed legally blind, well, they already know that they have this vision loss that if it's too difficult to get a referral, you can contact the office directly. But sometimes I get patients who hear about me and they think they have a vision loss and I get them to see 2020 with regular glasses. They're not a low vision patient. I only see patients, or I prefer to only see patients who live with vision loss. There's not too many people who specialize in low vision, and there's so many people out there who have vision loss who are just not aware of the aids that are available, that I want to be dedicating my time to help those individuals. I have wonderful colleagues, so many of them, who can um, do the routine eye exams and get people to see 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.